Hello and welcome to The Appointment. I am Pranjal Sharma. Joining me today for a conversation is Saurabh Srivastava, who is a doyen of the technology industry in India. Uh, Saurabh is the co-founder of NASCOM, the Indian Angel Network, as well as the Indus Entrepreneur. Saurabh, thank you so much for being with us. I must begin by congratulating you also for uh, the honor that the government has bestowed. You are now a Padam Shri as well. I want to uh, discuss with you, uh, Saurabh, about um, your journey uh, as uh, an entrepreneur and also somebody who created and helped create an industry in India. Um, I want to go back to the beginning of NASCOM. We are also talking about this at the time uh, when we were looking at 25 years of India's economic reforms. How was it in the early 90s when you thought that an institution like NASCOM is important and required? Uh, you know, when we started out, when we founded NASCOM, it was way back in 1988. Uh, the IT industry in India was less than $50 million. Uh, at that time, I was running Tata Unisys, which was one third of the software industry. TCS was 40%. Uh, and I don't remember how big they were. Infosys may have been half a million dollars or, or something like that. Uh, it was very, very difficult to do business. Uh, you know, we had 160% import duty on software. Same thing with, with hardware. Uh, we were trying to run a global business because all our entire market was overseas, was not in India. Computerization was a bad word in India in those socialistic days. And telecom connectivity was very poor. And for telecom connectivity, uh, if you didn't make a call from Delhi to Bombay before 7 in the morning, you had to wait till 11 at night. <laughs> and we were running a global business. Tata Yunus says we were in 41 countries. You can imagine what it took to do that business. If you traveled overseas, you could take $8 with you. And we had 11 overseas offices. Uh, it was a very, very difficult time to do business. Uh, so two things happen. First, all of us who were in it could see, I could see very clearly that this is a phenomenal opportunity. It's a phenomenal business. There's an unlimited overseas market. We are very well positioned to be as good or better than all of our foreign competitors. Huge profitability, great margins. So we saw huge potential. We felt this could be much bigger than the IT hardware business. And alongside that, you had an environment where it was almost impossible to do this business. So we said, how do we deal with this? And the first thing we thought of, we said, look, individual companies, already very small, talking to government, doesn't work. Most people in government are well-meaning, but they didn't really understand what the issues were. So we said we need to create an industry body where we come together, and then we try and explain to government what we need. But there was another reason. The other reason was that we were actually in a business which was very unique. So we were doing software development, that's right. But we were doing software development in India for markets globally. That was our only model. There was no other part of the world where companies were doing that. So who did we, so if we said we're doing well, what's best practice? So in some ways you also created a model for the rest of the world, not just for India. This whole idea of what you might call offshore software development, the offshoring, is a model we created. So what we did do, and most people who say that uh, where is the innovation and what the software industry did, intellectual coolies, just simply do not understand what we did. We actually took the entire chain of software, right from a customer requirement down to the last line of code development and testing. We disaggregated that chain. We did individual parts of it very differently. We put it together and then we delivered the same thing of a much better quality. So we completely innovated. Uh, and we realized that actually the other reason to have an, uh, a body of ourselves was we had to learn from each other. I mean, if I sat down and say, how well am I doing as a company? 
and said, so what are the best practices? What are my uh, salary costs as a percentage of total costs? What are my communication costs? I Who do I compare it with? Not Accenture. It has a different model. There were no IBM. benchmarks. No benchmarks. The only benchmarks we had were each other. But that also set a model, uh, sort of where uh, it was again new in, in many ways for Indian companies to work together with each other. Um, and today, if I look at how NASCOM is and how the technology sector works, I think some of that DNA maintains and it still manifests itself in the collaboration that we see at the highest level today. I think it's unique for industry bodies, not just in India, but globally to have this model. Uh, I told you the reason why this happened. And remember, at that time, all of us were starting out. Around the time I founded NASCOM uh, is also, or co-founded NASCOM, was also around the time I founded my first company. Uh, and most of us were doing that at that time. So no, none of, nobody was anybody. You know, we were all startups. We all had no money. We were all professionals. We never made a distinction between being an owner and being a professional in your own company because that's who we were. We all started as trainees somewhere. Uh, and we found that we had huge need to collaborate. It helped each one of us to do it. Uh, and to give you an idea, when I founded IS Infotech, it took me a year to get government permissions to start the company. Uh, my entire model was based on development through communication lines. Uh, all you could get at that time was a line which was 9.6K. <laughs> mostly worked at half the speed. Mostly worked at half the speed and only worked half the time. That's what we had at that time. And in that scenario, we all were able to work very closely together.